Welcome to my economics channel where I love discussing the subject, but most importantly, I love to make something fun and interesting to learn. And to that end, we're going to be covering an EE video or Economics Explained video that he made about a month ago about the necessity of recessions in the economy, a necessary evil, and about the business cycle. But the main thesis behind his video is that we have peaks and we have troughs. You know, we have regular business cycles that come and go maybe every seven to 10 years. And we also might have super cycles as well. But in general, over time, things are getting better. They are improving and so on. However, recessions are a necessary evil. And in particular, because they sort of destroy uh, inefficient institutions or businesses or business practices that are built up over time. You know, all of these things build up, all of these bad things, blockages, if you will, they start to happen, they start to do bad things to the economy, and then recessions are necessary, and they're a natural part of the cycle of life, I guess you would say, or this economy. And the idea is that interfering uh, in what would be a natural recession, as he calls it, is a bad thing. You know, anything the government does, or the Fed in particular, or any central bank, that's bad, because we sort of have a natural state to the economy, Things go up, they go down, and then we shouldn't interfere when things go down just because it's a little bit painful. Because if we do interfere, then that's going to lead to even worse results in the future. Now, as you might be able to tell from my tone or from watching my previous videos, uh, this is very misleading and it's very, very simplistic. And in fact, we don't actually have a firm grasp, a firm idea of what causes business cycles. However, one thing we do know is that a lot of recessions are just bad on their own. You know, they don't necessarily clear out blockages in the economy. And in fact, recessions can be brought around for many different reasons. For example, uh, bad government policy or just uh, bad actions on the part of the government or indeed from central banks uh, can bring about a recession. You know, things could be chugging along quite nicely. Businesses could be doing well. You know, we're not necessarily in a boom time. We're not in a trough. However, a bad decision or a bad series of decisions comes along and we go into a recession and that's obviously not a good thing. That's not a recession that we would want. However, one of my other contentions is that we don't have a firm idea for what is a natural state of affairs and why recessions would be a good thing because we're constantly meddling in the economy. And so it's hard to take away, it's hard to see what the economy would look without all of this meddling because, well, it's always been there. Because my argument is that without all of this meddling, we wouldn't have this economic growth. And actually, just before we get into the video, I do want to point out that this video actually isn't that bad. This video is actually not as bad as previous videos he's made, where he's made crazy and outlandish claims uh, with very, very little to back it up. And that's ultimately a good thing because he has a very large audience and it would be a shame to be sprouting nonsense uh, to millions of people. And I like to think that my videos had a hand in that. That's at least what I like to tell myself. But without any further ado, enjoy this soothing B-roll and let's get into EE's first claim. Since industrialization, modern consumer focused economies have followed the business cycle. The business cycle is the observed cycle of economic expansions during periods of high employment, consumption and consumer confidence and contractions during subsequent periods of low consumption, employment and consumer confidence. These booms and busts, as they are more casually known, tend to have a frequency of about 7 to 10 years, and some economists have added that these cycles take place within larger cycles that play out over decades or even centuries. Thankfully, most economists will also point out that these cycles tend to trend upwards as economies grow over time, despite some temporary setbacks. That's all fascinating, but is this boom and bust pattern of modern economics a bug caused by human nature? Or is it a feature of the systems that we have built that provide us with some kind of benefit? A necessary evil of sorts. So, the business cycle. EE has laid out a very simple and easy to follow story of what the business cycle is. Ultimately, I think that's one of the reasons why his channel is so popular. That it's sort of one thing leads to another, leads to another, and it's very easy to follow. Uh, however, as you'll notice, and as I've pointed out in my other videos, he rarely shows his sources. So let's actually examine the literature behind the theory of business cycles. And you'll see that it's much more interesting than the very simplistic story that EE e. lays out. So EE's e. answer is somewhat correct. But from source 11, we see that it's credit growth that leads to the boom and bust cycles, and specifically credit growth supply to households. 
There is an element of over-exuberance on the part of households leading to booms. However, this same over-exuberance seems to stem from the supply of credit in the first place and not be the cause of an increase in supply of credit. It should be noted that the authors don't have a definitive answer for what triggers the expansion of the credit supply in the first place. Empirically, the authors find that a sudden increase in household debt-to-GDP ratio leads to a three-year increase in the ratio, followed by a sharp fall over the next seven years. Quote, The household debt cycle is closely connected to the business cycle. We show that a shock to household debt generates a boom-bust cycle in the real economy that is similar to the credit cycle. Growth increases for two to three years and then falls significantly. End quote. The paper differentiates between credit supply and credit demand with regards to household debt. In terms of credit supply, they look at the global financial crisis and the loosening of restrictions with regards to lending by the big banks. This is what they call a credit supply shock. However, there was a dramatic increase in credit supply from 2001 to 2005, which is still three years before the crisis began. The authors find that house prices are more likely to be a response to credit supply rather than the cause. This is from the US. However, they also find similar results from other European countries. It should be noted that this boom-bust cycle caused by credit expansion doesn't apply to a rise in firm debt or government debt. They say that households may take on more debt during a boom phase than would normally be socially optimal, as people then see their actions as affecting only them, not realising or indeed caring what their actions might do in the aggregate. Basically, people rationally know that borrowing more money during a boom could mean more pain later in the aggregate, but do so anyway because it's rational on the individual level, even as I mentioned if it's not on the aggregate level. However, the paper finds that while this is a neat theory, this doesn't quite show up in the data. Instead, they find a common belief arises whereby more credit allows optimists to increase leverage and therefore raise asset prices. And then a positive credit supply shock gives the optimists' expectations greater weight with regards to asset prices. This then becomes a self-fueling system. A good example here is NFTs, of course. And as it's actually been shown, the market for NFTs was surprisingly small given the large amount of money involved. Indeed, it was only a very small amount of people which held a large amount of the outstanding NFTs. And a lot of the sellers were selling the NFTs to themselves at inflated prices to then show that this is essentially a boom phase for a new technology. They were essentially creating their own cycle. And so the NFT boom-bust craze could be seen as a miniature model uh, for the boom-bust cycle that we see in real life. And so the authors conclude, quote, First, credit supply expansions lead to a boom-bust cycle in household debt and real economic activity. Second, expansions tend to affect the real economy through a boost to household demand as opposed to an increase in productive capacity of firms. Third, the downturn is driven initially by a decline in aggregate demand, which is further amplified by nominal rigidities, constraints on monetary policy, banking sector disruptions, and legacy distortions from the boom. End quote. And in fact, this is one of the things that happened during the global financial crisis. Aggregate demand dropped initially quite a lot, and then other factors, especially of course around the banking sector, exacerbated an already bad situation. However, from the paper, it is worth noting that some credit booms haven't led to crashes. And so this time, moving on to another source, this time source 3, the authors confirm the cyclical nature of wages and prices during booms and downturns. The reduction in real wages during expansions appears pronouncedly larger compared to the rise in real wages during booms. So the flexibility of prices moderates 
the increases in real wages and output during expansions. However, these same prices don't do the same when it comes to downturns. Prices adjust upwards and we get inflation, and eventually this will be one of the factors that will bring about an end to the boom. Quote, Price rigidity exacerbates the reduction in the real wage and output contraction during recessions. The combined evidence supports the implications of the sticky price explanation of business cycles. End quote. Basically, prices don't want to move downward much during downturns, and so you lose real purchasing power. However, the prices for goods and services don't go down as fast, and so you're an even bigger loser when it comes to downturns. And we get the next quote. Empirically, the support for these dynamics comes from the observation that recessions do not depend on the length of expansions, but recoveries depend on the depth of recessions, end quote. And this point will become important later on in the video. The paper also states that during expansions, there are potential long-term costs of a central bank acting too early on the basis of inflationary pressures. And this is potentially one of the reasons we saw central banks around the world take their time with raising interest rates in the face of the ever-increasing inflation we saw since early 2021. And so that's a basic overview of business cycles, at the very least the major theories. And so it's not as clear-cut as EE would make it out to be. If it is indeed the credit supply shocks that are one of the main drivers behind the business cycle, and indeed boom-bust cycles in general, we don't know what causes this credit supply shock in the first place. And so from that point of view, we can't simply blame the government or, you know, big businesses or the private sector or what have you for the boom-bust cycle or indeed just the credit cycle. There are no easy causes and there are no easy solutions. If there were, central banks would have solved this a long time ago. And so how I wanted to end this admittedly lengthy section on is that we do indeed see when central banks screw up. We see, for example, when they exacerbate crises like they did in the global financial crisis, and we see that recently they might have indeed acted too slow on inflation, and now inflation might be getting out of hand. However, what we don't see is when they prevent crises in the first place. One of the things that central banks are supposed to do is deflate expansions and soften blows uh, when it comes to troughs or just busts in general. And so indeed, if they do stop uh, what would have been a recession or a larger recession or indeed a depression, we don't see that. We simply see things going on as they normally would have. We think that, oh, this is just a normal uh, reaction. This is a normal course of events. We don't see that the actions that the Fed or any central bank took to prevent those recessions in the first place. So that's just something I wanted to point out in defense of central banks. And actually, to end this section, we can throw in another theory of the boom-bust cycle, in that this time from Source 8, they say that it's the aggregate reallocation of savings towards safer stores of value, think things like US Treasuries, that are one of the major causes of fluctuations in the macro economy. And so here, the authors are arguing that one of the major causes, or one of the major drivers, of the boom-bust cycle that we see is the aggregate decisions of people and their savings. And so I'm not going to pretend to fully understand this paper. It was fairly dense for me. However, the authors are basically arguing for another driver or another cause of the boom-bust cycle in that it's the aggregate decisions, you know, an entire country's decision of what to do with its savings. And when a large majority of people want to move their savings into safer stores of value uh, rather than uh, more speculative ones, then this is one of the major drivers of fluctuations in the economy, and indeed the boom-bust cycle. For the past five decades, the world has shifted to favour free trade and globalisation, all for the arrangement to be challenged with a global pandemic, disrupted supply chains, labour crises, trade wars, and actual wars taking place on the doorstep of the largest economic region in the world. Despite this, most economic metrics are looking pretty good. In the US, growth is strong, unemployment is below 4%, and asset markets are hovering around all-time highs. But has this only been achieved by subverting the natural order of things with the most expensive and expansive fiscal and monetary policy decisions in history? 
Are we entering a new age where serious downturns caused by genuine economic hardships can be avoided with piles of cash? Or is this all just putting off the inevitable and potentially making it worse further down the road? What does the natural order of things mean? And how would we define that? Is the natural order of things simply when the government doesn't get involved? Or when the government only gets involved just a little bit? Or is it simply any action or any large-scale action that the central bank takes? How would we define what is a small level of action that a central bank can take? Is it simply letting the private sector do whatever it wants? Is that the natural order of things? So EE derisively calls all of the monetary stimulus simply piles of cash. This implies that there weren't targeted relief programs and that the Fed can only stimulate the economy and nothing else. And so, as is evident now, with the case of inflation in the US being 8.3% and possibly could be rising in the future, the stimulus programs from the government and the loose monetary policy from the Fed were indeed too big. However, they almost certainly saved, not just the US but also the rest of us, uh, from an even bigger downturn later down the track. If all we get as a result of all of this stimulus is a period of elevated inflation, it will indeed have been worth it. If other side effects follow, then we'll have to talk about those later down the track, but for the moment the recovery chugs along. But going on to the next point, what makes a downturn inevitable? Why is it natural that things should go up and go down, and that doing anything to stop that is quote unquote interfering with this natural state of affairs? The problem with this framing of a quote interfering Fed or central bank is that it assumes there can be a pure economy with little to no interference from any technocrats, and that this society runs on its own. But this just doesn't exist and has never existed. Weak states tend to wither away and die, whilst generally only stronger states survive. But these stronger states tend to be bigger ones, and ones that interfere in the economy or in its citizens' lives in different ways depending on the time period we're talking about. So, talking about a natural state of affairs, let's look at global GDP since 0 CE. I'd argue that the global GDP growth since around the mid-19th century is an absolute aberration of human history, and that a world with no growth is the norm. This is the natural order of things. Economic growth in itself is only possible because we mess around with our environment and social orders. We lived just fine as hunter-gatherers for hundreds of thousands of years. And so, government stimulus programs and loose monetary policy from central banks, including of course, especially in the case of the US, this is just an extension of what we've been doing for the past 200 years, and this is indeed required in this new environment where we expect constant per capita growth year on year. Absent this sort of intervention in the economy, eventually we would revert back to the growth levels that we saw before the 18th century. Aggregate supply and aggregate demand are the terms that economists use to describe the total supply of goods and services in an economy and the total consumption of those goods and services respectively. Economic growth can be achieved by increasing either of these factors, but in the long term you really need to increase both of these together to achieve stable economic prosperity. It is important to note that from source 11, long run economic growth is achieved through capital accumulation, technological growth, and an increase in labour input, either workers or hours worked. And this isn't as straightforward as it may seem. From source 12, there seems to be a trend of slower growth in the US since about 2009. The per capita growth used to be around 2.1%, but is projected to become 0.9% over the next 25 years. And so the following is a long quote, but it's basically better than anything I could say. So quote, The growth rate of output per person equals the growth rate of output per hour plus the growth rate of hours per person. While per person output growth was relatively steady over the entire period between 1890 and 2007, growth of output per hour of hours per person were not. In particular, labour productivity experienced a half century of rapid growth between 1920 and 1970, then slowed markedly after 1970. 
This productivity growth slowdown did not dampen the growth rate of per person output because the growth of hours per person was bolstered by the entry to women into the labor force. End quote. Economic growth caused by increasing demand without increasing supply is also possible, although equally unsustainable in the long term. Say an economy gives $1,400 checks to all of its citizens. That means everyone has more money and can buy more things. This increases total demand. Sure, but what is the reason for the stimulus checks in the first place? It's to plug a large hole caused by the drop in economic activity. Clearly, right now we have inflation that might be with us for a while. But that's one price to pay for not allowing the economy to go into freefall. Also, as per Source 16, counterfactual analysis shows that the stimulus programs were definitely worth it, even if they have led to higher inflation that we are facing right now. In both Australia and the US, we have very high inflation and low levels of unemployment. But would the opposite case be preferable? Very few people would want that. From Source 4, we understand that there are far-reaching implications of monetary and fiscal policy, and that if they aren't aggressive enough during downturns, this could lead to permanently lower growth after the downturn has ended. In this regard, we can think of the really slow growth that both the US and Australia faced after 2009 when the global financial crisis officially ended. During the GFC, the Fed and other central banks weren't aggressive in their reactions, and this also goes for governments, and partially as a result, we had slower growth for over a decade after. This is one reason why the Fed and other central banks, and indeed governments, acted so quickly and so aggressively once it became apparent we were facing a worldwide pandemic. So far, we have elevated inflation, 8.3% in the US and 5.1% in Australia currently, and who knows what the future holds. However, to that point, the paper also argues there are potential permanent effects for running a high-pressure economy during good times. But why does all of this mean that we need recessions? There are two broad classifications of economic downturns that we experience, and by now you can probably hazard a guess at what those are. Demand and supply downturns. Demand-based recessions are the ones that we are most familiar with, and they are the foundation of the cyclical business cycle. During good times, people get good jobs, they use those jobs to take out big loans, they use those loans to buy lots of things, and the companies making those things use this revenue to give people good jobs. This debt eventually needs to be paid back, which is what causes the debt cycle. Okay, let's back up. It's not that simple. From Source 7, it's not so much that a drop in aggregate demand causes recessions on its own, but that they multiply effects which eventually deepen a downturn. As an aggregate demand shock arrives, people become overly pessimistic about their incomes and the state of the economy, and this amplifies the original drop in aggregate demand. This is despite incomes not necessarily falling, however people just perceive their incomes as falling and act accordingly. And from Source 6, we understand that growth falls sharply during periods of high inflation, however recovers surprisingly quickly after inflation falls. The authors don't find that a reduction of high inflation carries short to medium run output costs. High inflation might shock policymakers into instituting productivity enhancing reforms that might not have taken place if not for the period of high inflation. And actually, the paper does agree with one point that EE makes, in that crises do indeed destroy old rent-sinking coalitions that block growth. The paper finds that investment is slow to react to policy changes in a post-crisis recovery. Quote, The slow response may be due to the uncertainty and loss of credibility created by inflation, as investors wait to see if stabilisation is permanent. End quote. Also, investment follows growth, rather than the other way around. This is important, as EE is trying to make you believe otherwise. And following on from what I said earlier, from Source 9, with wages being so slow to adjust during the global financial crisis, the paper finds that this almost certainly exacerbated the fall of employment during this period. 
These same downturns also create new opportunities for businesses which are robust enough to make it through. If a car manufacturer goes out of business during a downturn, they will be forced to liquidate their machinery and lay off their staff. That is capital and manpower that can be utilised by a company that was able to survive this downturn. Of course, not all of these workers will be rehired, which is another way that recessions can kind of do some good. Most economists are extremely hesitant to talk about any benefit to economic downturns. So we have to ask ourselves, do downturns really represent economic opportunities for new businesses or simply businesses in general? And do they really get rid of underperforming workers? And so the point behind what follows is that there are no clear-cut answers to what EE e. is asking. And so the point I'm trying to make is that booms and busts are not so clear-cut. And when it comes to a bust or simply a recession, there are many different reasons why a recession can occur and recessions can also be exacerbated by bad policy in the first place. And so it's not a simple matter of a recession coming along and clearing all of the bad things uh, that came before it and that caused the recession. Indeed, it could be a bad policy or something else exacerbated or brought about or was one of the main contributing factors to the recession and that if this recession hadn't happened, the economy would be in a better place. It's not as clear cut as a recession coming along and just clearing all of the bad businesses or all of the bad business practices that came before it. It could be the fact that bad policy or other external factors contributed to the recession and then this is what led to bad decisions on the part of businesses. Not necessarily that the businesses were bad to begin with or that they had developed bad habits along the way. From source 10, we see that business cycles are not so easily predicted. And yes, whilst booms and busts do share some characteristics over long periods of time, these are all identified after the fact. It is very difficult to predict the peak or the trough of a boom slash bust based on duration alone. And there are many other factors involved. And one of those factors is monetary policy, which is what we're discussing here, and indeed in my channel in general. So quote, Various combinations of internal stresses and imbalances with external disturbances, including major policy errors, can cut the life of an economic recovery short or bring on an unsustainable boom. Conversely, well-chosen policies and other favourable developments can prolong an expansion by helping keep a slowdown in the economy from sliding into an absolute decline or a speed up from creating inflationary demand pressures. End quote. The authors state that a recession may create the conditions for the next boom cycle or the recovery may be accelerated by stimulative policies. Quote, in short, the considerations of predictability and costs argue against the idea that business cycles are strongly and stably periodic, end quote. And so this quote is a good one because it goes entirely against EE's main thesis, or one of his main points, in that business cycles are so easily predicted, or at the very least that there's an easy regularity to the boom-bust cycle in the economy. The authors then conclude by saying that the variability in length of booms and busts is large enough that the timing of the cyclical turning points, particularly the peaks, are demonstrably difficult to forecast. And so when someone tells you that they can tell when there is a peak of a boom or the trough of a bust, especially all those financial influencers who are trying to sell you crap, these people are straight up liars. And so to reiterate, the length of time of either a boom or a bust is not of much help in predicting the date of its end and what matters more are the dynamics of the economy, of policy, and of the changing business situation. Economists model something called the NARU, or the Non-Accelerating Inflation Rate of Unemployment. This tracks the relationship between inflation and employment. The more people that are employed, the higher the inflation rate will be as the increased cost of salaries and unproductive workers are passed along to consumers. This is compounded by the increased aggregate demand coming from the same households that will be demanding those higher wages. So we have to ask ourselves, is it really a simple case of when there are more people employed, or simply that the unemployment rate is lower, that then we will automatically see a higher inflation as a result? 
I won't go into detail into this point because this could basically be its own video, but just to point out that this simple relationship that EE relies upon simply doesn't show up so easily in the data. We can't draw any firm conclusions. And we can also see uh, this is also affirmed by David and Alfato, uh, I hope I said his name correctly, on Twitter. And if you enjoy economics as much as I do, you should definitely be following him on Twitter. But as you can see, this simple relationship, this simple trade-off, does not show up so easily in the data. And therefore we can state with certainty that EE on this point is wrong. And so that's all I wanted to say in this video. I hope what I've shown is that if it was so easy to spot the business cycle, you know, the peaks and the troughs, you know, the length of time that they've been going on and all that, if that was so easy to see in the moment, then the central bank or the government could then stop these high peaks and these low troughs. They could smooth out business cycles. They could engineer it so that we didn't have these really high peaks and these really low troughs. You know, we could have a much smoother experience in the economy. However, as I've shown, there are a lot more factors at play that are ultimately more interesting than the simple story that EE is trying to paint. And also there's just a human psychology element involved as well. That has to be dealt with by any central bank and by any government. But I also hope that I've proven that recessions are bad and they can come around for a variety of reasons and they're not a necessary evil as EE would like to make you believe. And ultimately that the economy is much, much more colourful uh, than the very simple story he would like you to believe. And if you want to verify the truth of my claims, I urge you to check out the sources uh, that are posted below. However, if you have any questions, don't hesitate to ask below and I'll do my best to answer them, or at the very least I'll collect the questions and answer them in a future video. But if you wouldn't mind subscribing and sharing this video so I can reach a wider audience and ultimately eventually earn money, uh, because that would be amazing for me, and maybe in a third hand sense it will be amazing for you as well. But. Thank you for sticking with me through the end of this video and I hope to see you guys in the next video.